Um, first of all, I want to, I'm very grateful that all of you came here today. I'm very uh, privileged and honored to be here to speak to you. Um, I'm going to be speaking on the history of radiation therapy. We're going to talk about some of the past, some of the present, and the current technologies. And I'll be making connections um, with certain parts of the book um, that you all read, The Common Read, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. So before I start, I want to thank a couple people. Rosalind, first of all, um, I'm not sure if she's in here right now, but I'll, I was very excited. I actually just started here at MCC. Um, my name is Nora Uricchio. I'm the program coordinator for radiation therapy, and that's a new program that started here at MCC in the fall. So it was probably my first week here, and I get this email from Rosalind, and it was this common read book. And I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. And then I saw what the book was, and I was very excited about this book because I taught a class in the fall called Understanding Cancer. And I felt that that book would fit right in line with the curriculum that I was going to be teaching. So I was very excited to adopt that book. And then um, as we progressed through the semester, I talked to Rosalind, and that's why I'm here right now. I also want to thank Dr. Selner. Uh, Dr. Andrew Selner is our medical director for our program. And he, um, when I told him I was speaking here today, he actually was very helpful to me. He actually shared a lot of his resources. And I actually have a, a couple of books um, that were from the 40s and 60s that he still had in his office on cervical cancer and radiation treatments. So I thought that was pretty interesting and pretty great for, that, for those resources. And I also want to thank Harvey, who is my office um, buddy. And um, it was helpful for me to talk to him and get his perspective of what he knows and doesn't know about radiation and also his personal family um, experiences. So that was helpful for me to shape um, some of my thoughts as I, as I created this presentation. So what we're going to cover is the history of radiation therapy. We'll look at how uh, x-rays were developed. We'll also talk a little bit about the hazards. And we'll, again, we'll talk about current treatments. And we're going to look at the cervical cancer treatment specifically. So I'll be talking about equipment um, and making some connections back. All the, I, I'll bring it full circle and bring it back to um, Henrietta Lacks's book. So here are the resources that I used for this presentation. And again, some of the older ones from 1947, which was perfect. And this, um, the book also published on cervical cancer in 1962 helped me make some real connections with what um, Henrietta Lacks radiation treatments were like. So just to summarize some of the parts of the book that really piqued my interest, because obviously I'm in radiation therapy, and um, certainly when it was very interesting for me to read that she was getting treatments. So to summarize some of those things, she had two radium treatments in the month, and we'll talk about what that, those were. And she also had x-ray therapy, which was treatment every weekday for a month. Interestingly enough, we still do what we, it's no longer called radium therapy, but we still don't do those treatments, and we still do x-ray therapy. Um, she also talked about the side effects, and one of the side effects that she was surprised and did not know about was her loss of fertility. And also, um, some of the other side effects quoted is three weeks after the x-ray therapy, she began burning inside, and urine came out feeling like broken glass. So those are some of the side effects that, you'll, that people can experience from radiation. And then the other quote was, the skin was burned from Henrietta Lacks' breast, from her breast to her pelvis. And I'll explain why that is, and hopefully um, make you feel a little at ease if you ever, hopefully never have to have radiation treatments, but if ever, you ever did, um, some of the current technologies now of how we've improved. Um, and so hopefully people aren't getting as burned as what it was in Henrietta's day. So William Conrad, Conrad Rankin um, was a German physicist. And he discovered x-rays November 8th in 1895. And there's other people who were doing um, these kinds of testing and discoveries. He actually conducted cathode ray experiments and noticed that there was gl this glow. And even if he put a covering or cardboard or anything over that, that the glow would still, he would still see um, this glow. So shortly after he discovered this, he actually took an x-ray of his wife's hand. And this is the, the famous x-ray that any time you talk about the history of radiology, you'll see this. Um, we do it in our presentations when we're doing our information sessions. So this is um, Mrs. Renkin's hand, the first x-ray that was taken. And then shortly a few um, days after that, about a week later, he actually did, delivered a written presentation on his discovery of x-rays. Around the same time, really weeks, months later, 
radioactivity was discovered. And this was discovered um, with the work of Henri Becquerel, who was born in Paris, France. And he had started working on radioactivity, also knew about Rentkin's discovery. And around that same time, Marie Curie was very interested in learning more about this. So she did her doctoral thesis. And her husband actually ended up joining her in her work. And the Becquerels and Curies earned the Nobel Prize in Physics a few years later because of their discovery. Marie and Pierre Curie went, and, um, went on to discover radium, and that was in 1898. And because it's Women's History Month, I had to take a few minutes to talk about Marie Curie. She is actually an incredibly amazing woman. If you think about it, in the early 1900s, um, the work that she did. So she was actually born in Warsaw, Poland. Um, she couldn't attend the University of Warsaw because that was for men only, so she attended underground classes. She eventually made her way to Paris, earned her degree in physics, and then um, did her doctoral thesis around the work of radiation and radioactivity. Marie Curie actually coined the term of radioactivity, and actually she was the first woman to receive a Nobel Prize in Physics in 1903, which is a, I think is pretty remarkable. Marie Curie also earned her second Nobel Prize, and this time in chemistry, and that was um, for her discovery of radium. And I didn't mention this, but her daughter, Irene, also uh, became a scientist and also was, um, earned an, a Nobel Prize as well. So shortly after the discovery of x-rays and um, radioactivity, they started using this, they called it an x-ray because x, as in math, we don't know, it's an unknown value. So that's what they coined it because they didn't know what this ray was. So it, it basically stuck. We still call it x-rays today. But they started using these x-rays and this radioactive material to do different kinds of treatments. And they actually did try to treat cancer and skin cancer. We also tr um, treated benign diseases as well because they didn't know the hazards of radiation. They just thought this was this miracle ray that could fix and cure everything. Um, there were definitely some side effects seen from these healing rays. And um, at that time, there was very low energy x-rays. So it couldn't penetrate. Like some of the external beam x-rays that we were talking about that Rankin discovered, they were very low en energy x-rays. So they really couldn't penetrate deep into the body. So then they decided to start using radium internally, which was coined Curie therapy. Um, and they began using this in the early 1900s. So Baccarel, the radiation obviously does have some side effects. Baccarel and Pierre Curie would have small samples of radium in their vest pockets. And they experienced erythema. Can you guys still hear me? OK. <clears throat> so we're going to pretend that this egg is, is radium. OK? So I'm going to give it to somebody, and you just hang on to it. So that's what they would do. They had this magical ray. And they didn't know what it did, so I'm going to give you the egg. If you get tired of holding the egg, pass it on. I'm going to spread the love. So that's what they did. You know, so they had, it's like taking this, it's a plastic puzzle. It's not, there's nothing wrong with that egg that I just handed over. So there's nothing wrong with that egg. It's no, nothing but an egg. It's a puzzle. Um, but pretty much that's kind of their attitude. You know, they, they just said, wow, this is amazing. This is, you know, it's such great science. Wow, what are we going to do? So they you know, just carried it around, and they started to see, see the erythema on the skin. And in this picture, what I tried to show you is get a couple of pictures of erythema. So the skin reddening, I'm sorry. Just the laser work. So you can see the reddening here on this person's skin. And on this gentleman here, you can tell it's more of like a suntan. Do you notice this area here where it's just white? So if we were doing, which I'll talk about in a minute, if we're doing external beam radiation, this is kind of some of the side effects that you might experience on a, on a person's skin. Okay. So here we have Becquerel and Pierre Curie just putting this radium in their pockets. Pierre actually did a ra uh, apply radium to his arm, and he watched it create the different kinds of redness 
you know, probably got to what we call moist desquamation, where the skin is really breaking down. And then he stopped applying it and then uh, mapped out his recovery. All in the interest of science. So from the early 1900s, what ended up happening is we coined two things came out of that, two kind of branches of radiation therapy. One is external beam, what we call external beam therapy. And this is where we're using the x-rays externally to treat tumors. And it penetrates deep into the tissues. And these, um, this radiation is electronically produced. Okay, so there's no radioactivity. The other kind of radiation was the brachytherapy, also known as Curie therapy. Um, brachy is, um, is short. And basically, you're using radioactive sources and radiation is delivered at a shorter distance. Okay, so that's good for us when we're doing radiation therapy because if there's a critical structure close to where we want to give the tumor or the radiation to the tumor, the radiation will go to the tumor and not so much to the critical structures. Okay, so again, the external beam is electronically produced, so when we turn the beam on of radiation, it's on. When we turn it off, there's no radiation present. Brachytherapy or using radioactive sources is different. There's always radioactivity emanating. So the treatments, we're gonna talk about the external beam treatments first before we get to brachytherapy. There was different kinds of machines that were created um, for external beam. The first few were superficial and orthovoltage machines. I call these glorified x-ray machines. They're um, in the range of the kilovolts, which is the same energy range that we would take an x-ray. So if you go to the hospital and get a chest x-ray, it's the same energy that we would be using to treat patients. Um, so the, super, the superficial machine is um, this machine here, and this machine here is the orthovoltage machine. I don't know if you noticed, but um, this person who is operating the equipment. There's no shielding. Again, it was a time when we didn't know the hazards of radiation, so people would be taking x-rays or giving treatments and not ever shielding themselves from the radiation. Cobalt-60 was the next big advancement, and actually Cobalt-60 is the using of a radioactive source in the head of the machine. And this was a great discovery because we could actually do what's called megavoltage machines. So millions of volts were being used. And what that allowed us to do was deposit the maximum dose of radiation below the skin surface. Okay, so that allowed us to have skin sparing. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And the maximum dose was deposited at half a centimeter below the skin surface. So unlike the superficial and orthovoltage machines, where the maximum dose of the radiation is deposited at the skin surface, cobalt allowed us to go beneath, which helps uh, minimize that, those radiation burns. Then linear accelerators were discovered, and um, the first isocentric machine installed was in 1961. And what I mean by isocentric is that basically the machine and the table rotates around one single point in space. And so we do a lot currently in our radiation therapy world to make sure that that machine, very large machine, is rotating around that one point in space. And what the linear accelerator does is basically accelerate um, particles, and actually we use electrons that we're accelerating. And um, it basically starts, if you see on this image here, so elect an electron is emitted from here, and then it accelerates down this structure, hence the accelerator structure. And then the electrons act actually have to bend around, um, which we call the bend magnet, and then it hits a target. And once it hits that target and it's, it's transmitted through, radiation is created. And the electrons are traveling at such a high um, rate that we can cause or create very high energy beams. And the linear accelerator allowed us to have even more skin sparing. Here's a picture of our linear accelerator um, rooms. So again, so our pa patient is laying on this table. This table can move up and down, left and right, it can turn also. And also what we call this part of the machine is called the gantry. And so the radiation is coming out of this window. 
we can actually angle this radiation beam to any angle that we want to, which is very important for us, again, when we're trying to miss those um, critical structures and get the tumor. This is a more modern day linear accelerator, and it actually has um, some Im more imaging capabilities that allows us to view and target our treatment areas and make sure we're in the right spot. So when I was talking about skin sparing, to kind of talk about that concept again, or explain that concept, if we, if this is the skin surface here, this is representing the skin surface. If I have a cobalt-60 machine, then my isodose lines, um, let me explain isodose lines. I'm telling you a whole bunch of stuff in therapy that I teach like in a year of stuff. I'm trying to condense in an hour. Um, but I think hopefully I can get the concept through. So in these isodose curves, basically these are percentages. So if you look at these numbers that you're seeing on here, if you look at the 100% line, so basically what this, wherever the 100% line is where the dose is being deposited, you know, 100% of the dose is being deposited. If you just look at the numbers up above, cobalt 60 is, you know, closer to the skin surface. As I get higher in my megavoltage photons, I get deeper into the skin surface. And then when I go to 15 photons, I get even deeper into the tissue, okay? That's really important for us. Um, and I'll talk about that again, but when we talk about Henrietta Lacks and she had those skin burns, by having that dose deposited below the skin surface allows us to, or allows patients not to get those bad skin burns like Henrietta Lacks um, received. So the whole goal of radiation therapy is to maximize the dose to the cancer cells, minimize the dose to the normal structures, no matter how simple or complicated a treatment that we give in radiation, if we, we, that's our, always our goal. If it's a very small lesion that we're trying to treat or a larger lesion, we're always trying to maximize the dose to the cancer cells and minimize the dose to the normal structures. Our patients are treated five days a week and usually four to seven weeks. That's our current practice. Not too far different than what Henrietta Lacks experienced. She had a month of treatment. And the other thing in this image that I want to point out is this diagram here. This is a cross-sectional view of the patient. And this color wash that you're seeing is representing where the radiation is coming in. So the radiation uh, machine was angled here, all these different angles. The red is the area that we're trying to treat and the tumor that we're trying to eliminate. So it is important for us, we'll come in at multiple angles, again, always to try to minimize that dose to the normal structures. Once our patients are um, set up for treatment, and there's a whole process for us to do that, which I'm not gonna elaborate on today, um, but how we set them up to make sure that we're on target and exactly where we need to be is we actually have lasers. So you see one of our therapists here aligning a patient up, and you see that green line, and then here are the red lines. So we actually give our patients tattoos, and um, when we think of tattoos, I'm sure you're thinking of a butterfly or some other image um, but our tattoos are just freckles. So they look, they're no bigger than a freckle. And we give, um, or sometimes we just put marks like on this patient on your bottom right. We'll just put a mark on the mask and um, we're able to line that patient up accordingly to their treatment. Another great advancement that we did was called, it's called IMRT. And that stands for Intensity Modulated Radiation Therapy. And what happens within, with this is basically we're blocking critical structures again. So there is a device in the head of the machine that is basically a block that will, it's a lead block that we can actually, can be moved and modulated to, um, to eliminate or to move to where the dose, we don't want the dose to be. So in this bottom picture, you're actually seeing what we call the dose profiles of radiation. And I'll show you an example of that. And this here is showing you basically what the image, what the inside of the machine would be looking like. Okay, so these little leaves are moving in and out to try to um, block the areas we don't want treatment. As an example, here's the red again. This pinkish, reddish area is the area that we want to treat. 
but there's a little blue in this area here, and that blue is representing the spinal cord. So we want to treat the tumor, but not treat the spinal cord. So we can design a beam, a radiation beam, to avoid the spinal cord. And what these blocks are representing, the darker the block, the more the radiation is in those particular areas. This area that's white is no radiation is going to that area. So by using this intensity modulated radiation therapy, we're able to, again, modify the dose where, that, where the radiation is going. We're able to avoid those normal structures and get the dose to the tumor. Brachytherapy, again, is <clears throat> using a radioactive source directly or immediately adjacent to the tumor. And um, it, again, can give a very high dose of treatment to the desired site without treating some other critical structures. <clears throat> There's a concept of hot loading. So hot loading is when we would actually take the radioactive um, source and place it in the applicator. And I actually have some applicators here that I'll, some of them I'll hand around. Um, so the brachytherapy source, when we're hot loading something, that means that the radiation, again, is placed in these applicators. I don't know if you can see them up close, but um, if you want to kind of pass it around. So the brachytherapy source is in there. And that means when it's hot loaded, anybody who is around the patient is getting exposed to the radiation. So there is, you know, it's not the, the best way to do treatments. Back in the 40s and 50s, that's how it was done. They didn't have any other, any other ways. And the, the next method we devised was called afterloading. And some of those, actually, the, some of the things that are going around right now is actually an afterloading device. I have the hot loading device here, but I almost don't want to. Not that I don't trust you, but this is Dr. Solner's from, this was probably a device that was used um, on Henrietta Lack. Not this one, but it was very similar to this. And this is a hot loading device. So the after loading allows us to put the rate, we put these devices in the patient, and, the, and these devices are used for cervical cancer. Patients are anesthetized. These devices would be put in the person, and um, then after the patient has these devices in them, once they get to their room, we would actually put the radiation sources in their bodies. Okay, that's the afterloading piece. If you guys have questions along the way, let me know. I feel like, yes? Correct. Yes. There, right. So Roslyn asked a question about... Um, this device that's going around with brachytherapy, it's a great question. So with brachytherapy, you do get the device put in, your, in you. Um, and, and if usually these afterloading devices, the brachytherapy source or the radioactive source is put in there and the patient has that source in them for two days, let's say. That's one method of doing it. Okay. Um, and and it actually, in the book, it actually said, like, um, Henrietta Lacks actually had, like, she went overnight. So the radium source was probably put in her was kept in her probably overnight, then they took it out. And then she had to come in like two weeks later and have another application. So, question. As opposed to external beam where you're coming in every day for a treatment. So after loading allowed us to reduce the radiation exposure dose for patients. Um, when we talk about radioactivity, we have to talk about half-life. Not that I'm going to go into this in great detail, but I did want to highlight a couple of the sources that we use or used to use. One of them, the radium, um, that has a half-life of 1,623 years, which is one of the reasons we don't use that anymore. And the main reason we don't use radium anymore is because it decays into radon, which we know is very dangerous for us now. Um, we also used to use cesium. Um, cesium doesn't, is, was a relatively safe source. And... Um, we would put it in the patient, and then two days later, they would, that source would come out, and the hospitals would store that source till the next time they needed to use it. And these sources are put into those devices that's being passed around. Um, a source that we use now, Iridium, and we actually put this in what's called a high-dose rate machine, high-dose rate brachytherapy. And 
This is a similar situation where the device is in the patient and the source goes in the patient, but instead of giving, having the patient in for two days, they come in for one application, they're there for the day, they go home, they come in the next week, depending on what kind of cancer it is, they may come in the next week or two weeks later and get another application for brachytherapy. And I'll show you these devices. Um, I had to talk a little bit about cervical cancer and what that, what that is. Um, so cervical cancer is the most prevalent um, gyne gynecological cancer among younger women. It's common in um, women with um, lower socioeconomic status. And usually people with lower socioeconomic status don't get the screening done. It's also common in people who have um, early sexual activity, multiple partners, HPV, herpes, um, all have an increased risk of getting cervical cancer. One of the screening tools we use for cervical cancer is a pap smear. And again, in the book, it actually talked about, um, you know, pap smear was just being really discovered then and created then. So that's pretty, um, it's just a, a t perfect time in history, really, that all of that information was just coming out. Just a quick review of anatomy. The important parts, I guess, that I want to highlight. First, here's your uterus. And so the bottom part of the uterus is the cervix. And um, these two other sides of the vagina are called the vaginal fornices. So when we're putting those devices in a patient, um, one part's going in the uterus and the other parts are going into the um, vaginal fornices. A couple of critical structures when we're looking at a lateral view or a side view. So here's our uterus, here's our bladder, and here's our rectum. So for us in radiation therapy, our bladder and our rectum are, are really important critical structures, and we need to really make sure we're not getting too much dose of radiation to those, that patient. And um, the other is, that's not pictured on here is the small intestines. Okay? So those are the, probably the three main critical structures that we can cause side effects for our patients. When we're treating cancer, oftentimes cancer spreads to the lymphatics, so we have to treat the lymphatics as well. So I guess I just want you to note, our students need to know all the lovely names of all these lymphatics, but I want you to note the location of lymphatics. It's kind of on the, out, this is your um, pelvic bone, so it's on the outside of the pelvic bone that where the lymphatics, the primary lymphatics are for our patients. Um, and then it goes up into the periodic nodes. And when we're looking at a lateral view, those lymphatics go anteriorly or towards the front of the patient. So when we're treating a patient, so if I was treating a patient with what, what we call external beam, coming back to using our linear accelerator, the area that you see outlined is the area that we would treat. So in this diagram, we're seeing the uterus here, but we're not just treating the uterus. We're also treating all the lymphatics that would be associated with that. And same on the lateral view or the side view. Okay? So on our cervical cancer patients, we're treating a very large field um, of radiation. And again, those critical structures that are in there, the bladder, the rectum, and the small bowel. Here's an example of radiographs that are taken showing you that actual, like these are actual treatments of somebody who had cervical cancer. So you see again, we're treating a very large part of the um, pelvis and it's going up into getting all the treatment of the lymph nodes, okay? So on these patients, this patient, all of this area here is getting irradiated. This area right here is blocked. So this very large part here is getting radiation. Okay, so the radiation is affecting that whole patient. The, the good news, and this is a relatively current uh, patient, and this patient was treated in what we call the forefield, meaning that the radiation came in from the front of the person, the back of the person, the right side of the person, and the left side of the person. Okay, so we're distributing the dose a little bit. It's not all going in one way. 
um, but we're still treating a pretty large area. With regards to our, this particular patient getting a skin reaction, probably not so much because of the higher energy beam. And 10 MV I know means nothing to you, but the fact that it's a higher energy means that that dose is being deposited below the skin surface. Did this person have some side effects? Yes, they probably did because it's such a large area. And this is a cross-sectional view of that area. Um, the red is representing the area that we're treating, but you can see if you look at, so this is the area that's the tum where the tumor is. You can see uh, this line, these colored lines up here are representing where the dose is going. So again, it's showing us that we're treating more than just the tumor area. We're treating all the lymphatics up in here. If we apply some of the newer techniques, this is applying an IMRT technique, which is where we can really modulate the beam and really spare those normal structures. The red, again, is showing you where the radiation is going, but you can see there's this white or spot here that doesn't have red. That's where the bladder would be. Okay, so we're able to spare the bladder on this particular patient. And the bladder would be here, looking at a cross-sectional view. We can also spare part of the rectum. And if we look at this side view, this area here is where the lymphatics that we're trying to treat. We're also trying to treat the tumor, but this other area here is getting much less radiation. Okay, so a patient getting this kind of treatment, which is the current day treatment of how we do it now, would be getting experiencing a lot of fewer side effects than we have in the past. Our brachytherapy, which, um, coming back to the radioactive source, we use what's called a tandem and ovoid. And that tandem, um, which is basically a, I don't want to say a stick, but that, a, it's a stick that goes into the uterus. And the ovoids go into the vaginal fornices of the, um, of the vagina area. And then that allows the radiation to be distributed um, right to the cervix area right in here. Another picture of the device. Okay, so again, radioactive sources are going in these devices. And using this kind of device, the patient would be in the room for the radiation, um, the radioactive source would be in the patient for one or two days once they achieve a certain dose and the radiation comes out. And all of that would be calculated. Here's are some x-rays. We're always verifying to make sure we know where that radiation is going and see where if it's going to be um, hitting any critical structures. So we're looking at the critical structures again, the bladder and the rectum. This device, although it looks very different than the one you just saw, is very similar. So it's still using a tandem and ring. This again is the kind of brachytherapy radiation that we're um, giving now using, uh, again, the radioactive source. This device is actually connected to a machine and that radioactive source would go into the patient. Um, and these are images that are taken. So this, um, the patient again still has what the tandem in their um, uterus area. And now instead of the ovoids, it's actually a ring. So we're still using the same theoretical concepts but improving how we're doing that and how we're giving that radiation. Patients, when they're coming in, again, they're not coming in for days on end. They come in for the day, they get their treatment, and then they go home. Back to our book. Um, I found it very interesting that at John Hopkins, Hopkins Hospital, um, they used ra the radium since the early 1900s. And actually there was a surgeon there that was, this was from the book, um, Howard Kelly visited Marie and Pierre Curie. And Kelly actually brought back radium to the United States in his pocket. Who has the egg? Lauren's holding the egg. So can you imagine if Lauren, if that was radiation that she's holding and she's carrying it around with her 
wherever she goes. So she's not only exposing herself, but she's exposing everybody around her because that radiation is just out there. And that's what they did back then. They didn't know any different. They didn't know radiation was harmful. So John Hopkins was actually using and was kind of doing state-of-the-art treatments. When Henrietta Lacks got her treatment, um, it was pretty much state-of-the-art of, of like what, what we all do even now today, some of the treatments that she was receiving. So coming back to kind of what um, was said in the book. So she had two radiation treatments, two radium treatments, and then x-ray therapy every day for a month. And we already talked about the side effects. So when I was doing the research on um, and knowing what I know about radiation therapy and the history of radiation therapy and then reading her book, this is kind of what I equated. So her two radium treatments equated to brachytherapy. So she had radium placed in her body, and it might have been in a device such as the tandem and ovoids, and it was probably hot-loaded, meaning that the radio radioactive source was in the device when it was placed in her, and that everybody around her was getting exposed to that radiation during that time. And um, the other thing, too, is the radium decays into radon gas which is also harmful to all of us, um, and obviously Henrietta as well. The x-ray therapy, in the book, it actually coined the term deep therapy. So when we talk about deep therapy, historically from the radiation therapy perspective, we're talking about orthovoltage. And uh, if you, when I showed you the slides on orthovoltage, orthovoltage isn't deep therapy as we know it today. It really is depositing the dose at the skin surface of the patient. And the fact that it stated that she was treated and it was burned to her breast, um, I'm guessing that her periodic nodes were treated as well. So they treated probably, just demo on me, so they probably treated about here, and they, if I had to guess, they did a strip just along the periodic nodes, and then they actually treated her full pelvis, which we still treat our full pelvis today, but we're using a much higher energy beam than we would in the past. So because that orthovoltage deposited its dose um, to the skin surface is why it was, in the book it says she was black, okay? So, but what was happening is that that dose was so high on the skin surface but didn't necessarily get the amount of radiation too deeper into the tissues. So today what we do is we're much better able to, um, because of the higher energy beams that we have, we're much better able to get the dose to the tumor, and we also can come in with multiple angles. So again, we're always minimizing that dose to the normal structures as much as we can. So to summarize, um, so Henrietta, in my opinion, Henrietta Lacks had state-of-the-art treatment. She, um, what was used on her again was the, the same things that we use today, which I found amazing, you know, that, that back at, in the early 1900s, they were discovering and, and seeing things and doing all the work that we still use those theoretical concepts today. Certainly our technology has gotten a lot better and um, we're always trying to find ways to minimize our, our side effects for our patients, but we're really using some of the same principles. When we use brachytherapy, we still are using the tandem and ovoids. Um, and obviously we know about the radiation hazards now and we know that we can't be around radiation and just be exposed to it um, for no reason. So we shield our patients, um, we shield ourselves, and we only use radiation when it's absolutely necessary. Um, the external beam, again, it's some of the same concepts. In the books that I was using that were from the 1940s and the 1960s had very similar, um, like, the area that we're treating is very similar to what we do today, which I found pretty amazing, um, that it hasn't changed that much. Again, the technology really has changed that helps us give the treatments and hopefully reduces those side effects to our patients. So what we've learned, we've learned that we need to reduce um, exposure to people and radiation protection. So now, Anytime you get an x-ray or if you need any, any kind of x-rays at all, um, you need an order from a doctor. Okay, so you can't just find 
any radium on the streets or you know it, nobody's holding it in their pockets anymore it's very highly regulated um, by the state by federal agencies um, very strict regulations especially around the area of brachytherapy sources especially after 9-11 um, there was a big uh, fear that people were going to use like a dirty bomb and use radiation and get some radio radioactive sources and use that um, as a weapon so the hospitals found other ways to use those and they're really trying to get rid of a lot of their radioactive sources that we use anyways for treatment um, we are definitely using much more sophisticated equipment now to reduce our side effects and um, early screening is key for cervical cancer recommended that um, early on in your 20s that you're getting a pap smear the other thing is um, very important is that it's really important to educate our patients as if you read the book um, you saw that Henrietta definitely and her family were lacking some education um, that's still true today you know we all have different perceptions of different things of um, what we know and don't know and we all I'm sure have a lot of experiences of people who've had cancer you know, and when you hear that word cancer, you think people are going to die. Unfortunately, that still is true. But um, there's a lot of patients who are being cured from their cancers. And there's a lot of different, if you even look at breast cancer, if you talk about breast cancer, there's many different ways of treating those cancers. So everybody's experiences might be very different. So it's really important for us as healthcare providers to, to teach our patients. And that's, a, that's everybody. Everybody is involved in that process. It's a continual process. And one, another thing that I felt um, was important is, you know, don't let your love for science take, take over, um, you know, as opposed to the care for the patient. It's really important, especially in, in our world of radiation therapy, I call it high-tech, high-touch, and meaning that it's obviously very technical as some of the things I just showed you today. The equipment's very sophisticated. There's a lot of math and science involved, um, but it's also very much about the patient, and it's equally important to do both of those accurately, to make sure we're technically taking care and treating their patients very accurately, very precisely, but it's equally as important to make sure that we're taking care of the whole person, not just setting them up for their treatment. And it, no matter how um, great the technology is, it, it doesn't replace the, the human care and kindness. So I thought I'd leave you with a few quotes um, from Marie Curie. They were pretty, she was a pretty amazing woman. Does anybody have any questions? They're quiet. Yeah. So the primary ways of treating cancer um, is surgery is one of them, is just cut it out, is the primary method. So one of the things that um, if you have, the main thing with cancer in general is to get, detect, find the cancer early. If you can find the cancer early and remove it um, surgically, that's the best thing that you can do. A lot of times, cancers aren't found early or they're in a place that we can't remove it. So if we can't remove it via surgery, we'll use chemotherapy or radiation or the, the other methods. Chemotherapy is using drugs, chemicals that are put in your body, and that um, chemotherapy will circulate to get, um, to get the cancer is right now. cutting out a lot of the chemicals to target the actual cancer cells of that specific disease. a lot of research and then the so chemotherapy is one of them and then the last way is radiation so the question is if you didn't hear is um, did they continue to x-ray or give treatments to Henrietta because it wasn't working or because because is because they were unaware no actually it and that's a great question um, the protocol is to I'm I pretty I'm pretty sure like the protocol is to give that many treatments um, for her like for like today today's radiation therapy if you get external beam you're getting treatments from four to six weeks sometimes three weeks, it depends on the kind of treatment or what you're getting. But today's protocol for ra external beam radiation is you're in there Monday through Friday and you're getting daily treatments. 
it's a standard calculation. And I don't know what, how much they knew back then. I'm, I, actually, that physics book from the 1940s was pretty intense. Um, there was a lot of information in there, so I'm, I'm guessing that they did know, um, but that was the best they had. And even though that the, the thing of it with that particular kind of treatment, if she did get orthovoltage treatment, and again, that dose was being deposited on the skin surface, it doesn't mean the dose wasn't going to her pelvis or her cervix area. It just means that the mat, most of the dose was being deposited on the skin surface. So that's where today we can actually improve or have, you know, improve that, that because of those higher energy beams that we're using now, that radiation is able to go deeper into the, into the tissues so we're not burning the skin. And we also come in from multiple angles, again, so we're not giving that dose all from one spot. I'm guessing, again, I'm guessing, you know, just by on, through the research that I did, but I'm guessing she probably had radiation from the anterior, from the front of her, and from the back. I'm guessing that was probably it. Um, again, just from the, the research that I was able to, you know, things that I was able to find. Um, and they might have even been just from the front. Okay, so, and so it was pretty much a standard. It was probably like a four-week treatment. This is what you got, okay? And the side effects with her burning, like it said, the, the bladder was burning and charred. Unfortunately, we still do have side effects for our patients. Like, it's not like radiation is this great thing and we have all the problems solved. Like, our patients do experience um, side effects depending on what area we're treating. In the pelvic area, where you're not going to get that skin burn, if we're treating the breast, you probably will have some skin rending depending on your body makeup. You know, like I'm a fair kind of person, so I probably would get burned um, like a sunburn. You know, you, I would get that reaction. Um, and so they do, we still have side effects, and we monitor those side effects and have treatments for those side effects. Um, but I think that's where, like, as, as a therapy, as a therapist, we're a team, you know, we're working together. Um, when we give radiation therapy external beam treatments, we're working together with another therapist, and we see the patient every day, so they're often telling us what they're experiencing, and then we can relay that information to the doctor, to the nurse, to the social worker, to the dietitian, whatever it is that that patient needs, we're able to then facilitate that for, for our patients. Okay, so the question is, is how do we protect like, the people who are doing the brachytherapy, for instance? Again, we're highly regulated, um, and now, so, so when we were using like cesium, let's say, um, it was actually the physicists because they get paid more. No, just they do get paid more, but the physicists usually handled it. But it was all—it's all about our cardinal principles are what, students, times di distance shielding. So the further you are from the radiation, um, the less exposure you get, the less time you're around the radiation, and obviously we have lead shields. So we, with those different things, you can minimize your exposure. Always, we always, and now in our world, um, in x-ray or in therapy, you know, we always minimize how much radiation that we're giving. We, we are allowed a certain amount of radiation to be exposed to as a, as a worker, um, but we always try to minimize that. Now with our high dose rate, the source is in this machine that's protected, so nobody's handling that source. The, it's like catheters that get connected to this machine, and then um, and then that source comes out and goes in, and there and the patient's in a lead-lined room. And the other thing too, when we give radiation treatments, we're never in that room with the patient. The dose is just way too high of a dose, so we are never in that room. So we um, set the patient up in the room. We walk out, which I'm sure the patients can feel, you know, a little scared. But we always, we can see them. We have two cameras that we watch them. We can talk to them. Um, so, you know, we're communicating with the patient and we make sure that they know that, that they're, you know, that they're, they're being seen and heard. Uh, but we never can be in that room. Medicines that cause cancer? Um, e yes, there's actually, there are, and isn't it, the irony of it all is that here we are using radiation to cure cancer and radiation causes cancer. And there are some different kinds of chemicals and chemotherapy agents that potentially can cause cancer as well. Just like smoking, I have to hop on my soapbox. Um, smoking, 80% of cancers would be gone if nobody smoked. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that are out in the environment that do cause cancer. Um, what we don't know though is, you know, when you get cancer, it's, you don't necessarily know where you got it from. I mean, you can kind of guess because, but the cancer looks the same if you got it from smoking or if you had radiation exposure, it doesn't look different. 
Um, but yeah, so that's why we have to minimize our radiation um, and other any chemicals. So the question is, is if once we give the patient the, ther the radiation, can they give off the radiation? So brachy when we're giving brachytherapy, when we're doing a radioactive source, it is possible for the patient or their um, some of their things to be radioactive. Um, but for the most part, when we're giving radiation in the external beam, I, it's a switch. It's like a light switch. I turn the light switch on, you see lights. I turn it off, it's off. For the most part, that's how it is with radiation. The patient isn't radioactive when they go home. At least the external beam radiation that we do, it, their patients aren't radioactive. So that's a really, really great question. Um, they, they don't, they're not, they don't have any radioactivity. They're not gonna spread that. We don't get it. They're, they're not radioactive. The radiation has worked in their body. Then once we turn the beam off, it's off. And then the radiation will continue to work and damage the cells. Yes, it does. So radiation therapy does mutate the cells as well, which is why it can also lead to cancer down the road. So the question was, is like, what happens to the cells or how is it damaged? So if the cells, so if the cells are mutated, a couple things can happen. The cell can die and not replicate, um, which when we're killing, curing or trying to cure cancer, that's what we want is just those cells to die and not replicate. There is a chance that the cells might rep replicate and mutate, and then that mutation can become cancer. Thank you, everybody, for your attention. I appreciate you coming.